as motorcycle riders. When not riding a motorcycle is a very pleasant and relaxing sensation. Feeling the freedom of being outdoors on two wheels is really quite experience. Except for just one inconvenience. A question for you. How many of you enjoy carrying keys and fumbling through doses of them? I'm sure very few will raise their hands. Allow me to introduce you to this ring. At first sight, there is really nothing special about it. But in reality, it's more than just a ring, it's actually a key. This ring allows me to turn my motorcycle on and off without using my regular keys, thanks to this keyless ignition system I have installed. It's really a game changer. With this system, we can not only save several rings in memory and use them as keys, but we can also delete them as we wish. And every time we perform an action, for example, if we add a new ring as a key, we'll hear a sound played by a buzzer and also trigger this LED bar. The interesting part is that the way I have it installed on my motorcycle will allow me to use either the ring or my regular keys to start my motorcycle. I can use either one. So if for whatever reason I don't want to use my ring, I can always go back to my regular keys and vice versa, and they both will work just fine. But of course, I much prefer to use the ring, and I'm pretty sure you will too, once you do this mode on your motorcycle. In this video, you'll learn how this entire keyless ignition system works, so you can build and install one on your motorcycle. But before that, I just want to let you know that, along with this video, there is a documentation specially created for this project. There you'll find the parts list, tools, and a series of sections delving deeper into this project. So please do check it out. The video will be divided into four main parts. First, we will analyze how the whole system works. Then, we will learn about the circuit design. After that, we'll go over the code. And last, I'll talk about other important details, mostly concerning the hardware side of things. And then, we will conclude with a walkthrough of how I installed the system on my motorcycle. That way, you can do it too. As a side note, there will be a second part of this video dedicated entirely about the making of the rings. It really deserves a video of its own. It's a very interesting process, which leaves a lot of room to be creative. That being said, let's get down to the nitty gritty. First of all, let's see what this ring contains and how the technology that makes it special works. Inside of it, there is an NFC tag, which stands for Near Field Communication. This is a type of wireless technology, which is just a subset of RFID systems, the acronym for Radio Frequency Identification. This technology is not something new, and you probably have seen it before. It's commonly used for opening doors. As a form of contactless payment, and if you have a recent smartphone, it might already come with NFC integration, just to mention a few examples. Now, there are some differences between NFC and RFID systems. One of them is that, as the name implies, NFC only works at relatively close distances, a couple of centimeters at most. So for the ring to be detected, or any NFC tag, it has to be very close to the reader. This technology consists of two things, a reader with an antenna, as you can see here, this is what we are using this project. And then, an NFC tag, again, with its own small antenna, which you can find in different shapes and sizes. The interesting part is that the NFC tag doesn't need a battery to work. It relies purely on the electromagnetic energy emitted by the reader's antenna to supply power to its own electronics. It works by inductive coupling at a frequency of 13.56 MHz. So whenever you bring the tag over to the reader, it will immediately power on its own microchip, which in turn will communicate with the reader by changing the intensity of the reader's electromagnetic field. This is known as load modulation. The reader then translates this changing field into a digital signal, which contains information about the tag, and this is what we're really interested in. I had to point out that this is just an overly simplified explanation of what is happening, and there is much more to it, but I hope you get the basic idea. But, what about security? The manufacturer that makes these NFC chips is NXP Semiconductors. The tag that we we'll use here contains the NTAG203 chip, which is part of the MyFair Ultralight family of chips developed by this company. And even though you are able to store information in the tag memory, 
The only thing we will need from the tag in this project is the UID number, that is the unique identifier. This is a 7 byte zero number that is exclusive to each tag and is assigned to the tag after manufacture. We can't modify this number or clone the tags, hence the reason why we're going to use this number as our key. The manufacturer has developed other families of chips. One of the oldest and most popular ones is the MyFair Classic family, which you can seal by today. However, these chips were proven to not be secure. This was demonstrated by a group of people around 2007-2008 who actually managed to break the encryption of these chips. This really upset NXP because it proved that their cards used worldwide had serious security issues. As a matter of fact, now NXP semiconductors explicitly warns users to not use these tags anymore and instead recommends customers to use their other newer and more secure chips. And of course, one of them is the My Fair Ultralight family, the one that we're going to use for this project. As far as I am aware, I don't know of any security breaches related to this specific tag so far, except for this article I found while doing a little bit of research. But don't get alarmed, apparently the customer was to blame here since they didn't turn on the protection feature that this tag provides so that nobody can alter its memory contents. This really doesn't concern us because, as I said, we are only going to use the UID number of the tag for this project. Still, if you do know of any security flaws, please let us know. Besides, if someone really wants to steal our motorcycle, the faster option is just to use a tow truck instead of messing around with the electrical system. Well, unless that person is watching this video. Alright, let's continue. Now, let's look at this diagram. It depicts the hardware side of this project, the components that make up the whole system. This is what I have installed on my motorcycle. As we'll see throughout this video, the system is very modular. This makes troubleshooting easy and offers other advantages too. We're going to go over this diagram and learn how the system works. First of all, the brain of the entire system is this box on the left. Inside of it, we have the reader module attached to the cover and in the bottom, the main board that will control everything. As you saw in the beginning, I mounted this enclosure inside one of my motorcycle saddlebags for easy access. The central highlight of this board is the microcontroller, it's the 80 mega 320A, which is used by the famous Arduino Uno. With it, we are able to save several tags in memory thanks to a tag that we will call the master tag, but we'll look closer into this later in the code section. Another thing we we'll have inside is this buzzer which will play different sounds when the system performs an action, for example, saving or deleting a tag. Listen to this. Over here, we have a relay. This is where the magic happens. This is what we'll use to turn the motorcycle on and off. It is, of course, controlled by the mainboard. With the relay, we are able to bypass the ignition switch circuitry, and from a motorcycle, this process was really easy to do. In my case, I used to relays to achieve this, but we'll look into this later on. The next accessory is the circular enclosure. It contains a circuit whose only purpose is to generate this scanning effect for the LED lights, as shown by this animation on the right. I have it installed on my speedometer. It's really a very attractive add-on, but we can remove it whenever we want. Again, this has to do with the concept of modularity I just mentioned. The lights are not only for aesthetic purposes, but they also work in conjunction with the buzzer to alert us of what we are doing. For example, if the system is looking for a tag to save in memory, we will see that the light scanner speed will increase. This is not only useful as a sort of a warning, but it's a very nice thing to see in action. Now, before we go any further, when I first began this project, energy consumption was one of my biggest concerns. I wanted the system to use as zero current as possible or very yet, no current at all. Obviously, before we turn on the ignition, the reader has to keep scanning for potential body tags nearby. This means that it needs to be on all the time, and eventually this will drain the battery. Nobody wants to wake up and find out that their motorcycle is dead. You know how frustrating that is. So how do we solve this? Fortunately, after considering different approaches, I came up with a nice solution, which basically makes the system consume no current at all when the motorcycle is off. Looking back at the diagram, we can see two rectangles here, at the top. They represent switches. 
The simple components are just switches that are triggered whenever a magnet is brought near them. As demonstrated in this circuit, where I am just toggling an LED by taking a magnet and passing it by the red switch. With that in mind, the final solution works like this. I mounted a magnet on the rod that connects to the brake pedal mechanism and a red switch on the frame close to it, so that when the pedal is pressed, the magnet will cause the red switch to close. This will momentarily power on the main board. Afterwards, the microcontroller or MCU will take over and keep the system on once we depress the brake pedal. Naturally, the reader will start looking for tags, and if the system doesn't detect one for a predetermined number of seconds, it will turn off automatically. And if we want to power the system back on again, we'll have to press down on the brake pedal once more to start the process all over. Otherwise, if the board is on and we scan a valid ring, the motorcycle's ignition will turn on. And after all that, we can now proceed to start the motorcycle. This is basically how it all works. So, to summarize, by turning on the board momentarily to scan for attack, and that way be able to arm a motorcycle, we are wasting way less energy than if otherwise the system were to be on all the time looking for attacks. However, you don't necessarily need to install it on the brake pedal, you can mount it on other parts too. For example, on the brake lever, wood dress, or basically any part that allows you to trigger the red switch by moving the magnet. And if you want to go to the next level, you can even put a magnet on your boots and do it manually. This flexibility is one of the aspects that makes the system so versatile because it's not tied to one specific type of motorcycle. The same thing applies to the rings. You can carry an NFC tag in your wallet or put it inside your belt if you want to consider it really well. I personally think a ring is more convenient and faster to scan. Alright, this is what one of the red switches does. The other one that you see here serves as a trigger for a system to perform certain functions. The most important one is that it sends the MCU to sleep. Yes, to sleep. The thing is that once the motorcycle is on and we go for a ride, the reader will be on all the time scanning for tags. And let's not forget about the MCU and the lights. This obviously makes sense because the reader waits until we scan the tag again to turn the motorcycle off. This is really not a big deal. The ball actually draws very little current, only a couple of milliamps, but we can definitely do better than that. That's why I mounted another red switch on the kickstand along with a magnet, so that when we fold it up ready to go for a ride, this will cause the MCU to go to sleep, turning the LEDs as well as the reader off in the process. And as soon as the kickstand is folded back down, the MCU will wake back up again, switching everything on in the process, as if nothing had happened. And now we can proceed to turn the motorcycle off if we wish, just like what we normally do. This function certainly makes the system more efficient at the cost of one additional accessory if we want to put it in those terms. Initially, I considered other options to put the system to sleep when starting up the motorcycle's engine. For example, connecting one of the MCU's IO pins to the cutoff switch, or even creating a special circuit to detect when the ignition coils were active as the engine turns over. Anyway, going back to the diagram, down here we have the motorcycle battery to power the board, and a fuse connected in series for overcurrent protection. This is important. Well, that's it for this part, let's continue to the next section. Taking a look at the schematic, we see that it is divided into several sections for easy explanation. We review the circuit for the main board, and then the circuit for the light scanner, but before all that, this is a very important topic we need to grasp, because it's critical for the reliability of the electrical system. The topic is about transients, and those are momentary surges or spikes in voltage or current that can wreak havoc within circuits. Let's analyze this scenario. When we first turn the switch on in a motorcycle, the battery is the one that supplies power to the whole electrical system at first. However, as soon as we turn over the engine, the alternator takes over which in turn also charges the battery. The same can be said for cars. One would think that this is a smooth transition, but it's not always like that. Even though motorcycles already have a rectifier and regulator, the voltage output is not stable. But that's the least of our worries. In the automotive world, there is an undesirable effect known as load dump. This occurs when the battery is disconnected while the alternator is charging it. This might happen because, let's say, 
there is a broken wire or it's done on purpose. What happens next is that, for a short period of time, the alternator can suddenly supply up to 200 volts to the power rail. Yes, you hear that right. That can easily fry our board if it's not protected. And we aren't done yet. Basically, any component that has a coil in it, be that a simple relay or the motor from the fuel pump, can cause similar disruptions by transmitting voltage spikes along the electronic system. This is exactly what chainsaws are, and load dumps are probably the most destructive of all. This table shows a couple of more examples. Now, what I'm saying here is based on documents written for the automotive industry, but since motorcycles share many similar core components, it should apply to them as well. So, how do we deal with transients? Let me introduce you to this fascinating component, the TBS diode. This is the one that we use in our project, but you can find it in different packages. TBS stands for Transient Voltage Suppressor, and yes, this component is going to help us get rid of transients. This is their schematic symbol. There are two types, but we're only interested in the bidirectional one, and for simplicity's sake, I'm not going to talk about the differences between the two, because in the documentation, there is a section dedicated entirely to the topic. A TBS diode is connected in parallel to the circuit to protect it. In its normal state, it doesn't have any effect in the circuit, and basically, it's like if we had an open switch. However, as soon as a high voltage transient is present, the TBS diode will react by clamping the transient down to a volume known as the clamping voltage, and we end up with a waveform that looks like this. So the TBS diode protects the circuit, by diverting much of the high energy transient away from the circuit, allowing only a small fraction of the energy to flow through it. This is basically how it works. You may think that it behaves just like thinner diodes. However, TBS diodes are specifically designed to suppress transients, obviously, and they react extremely fast. Actually, the TBS diode we're using here can react in less than one picosecond in the presence of a transient. As you can see in this table, this is faster than the rise time of most common transients. This is truly a very robust component to prevent frying our board. Nice. Having learned all that, now let's analyze the circuit diagram. First and first, over here we have the output from the body going into the circuit, the positive and negative terminal, which as we saw before in the other diagram, there is a fuse outside the board connected in series and as close as possible to the positive terminal of the body. The two power lines that enter the board are connected to ferrite bits. That's their schematic symbol. Ferrite bits are very simple components, yet they have interesting properties. Look around your house, you might already see them using power cords. And as you might already notice, we have a big one on the wires that come out of the main board. There is a video from this channel, but you can see them in action on an oscilloscope. I'm going to leave a link to it. Basically, their purpose is to filter out high frequency noise thus helping to keep the input supply clean, because as we already know, electrical systems from motorcycles are very noisy. Next, we have to decoupling capacitors. They also add as filters by suppressing high frequency pulses. Their values are different in order to tackle different frequencies. The next component is our mighty TBS diode, which we previously learned about, and according to its data sheet, it will clamp transients to plus minus 33.2 volts which is an input voltage that the regulator can still handle safely, as we'll see in a bit. Then we have a diode that functions as the inverse polarity protection. It's a Schottky diode, so it has a lower forward voltage drop than regular diodes, at around 0.3 volts, which means a much lower power dissipation. Next, let's take a look at this part of the circuit, which I call the power control, because this is where the red switch connected to the brake pedal gets to turn on the circuit, and once the microcontroller takes over, we can turn it off again. Let's break the circuit down to get a better understanding of how it works. First, we have a Pichano MOSFET. This is basically our master switch. Remember that for a Pichano MOSFET to turn on, the voltage applied on the gate has to be lower than the source voltage, to put it in simple words. This is the opposite for in MOSFETs, where the gate voltage has to be more positive than the source voltage. So in our case, since we are using a Pichano MOSFET, we need to pull its gate down to ground to turn it on, and we accomplish this via the red switch, which will close whenever we press down the brake pedal. The maximum gate-to-source voltage for this MOSFET is 20 volts. However, as we know, 
The alternator output voltage is not stable. We don't always get to our faults, and it's not forgettable transients. Remember that the TV's diode we selected would clamp them down to plus minus 33.2 volts. Therefore, to better protect the MOSFET's gate, we need a thinner diode to regulate the gate voltage so it doesn't get driven at voltages that can damage it. This inner diode specifically provides a regulated 6 volt output, which is more than enough to turn the MOSFET on because it's a logic level transistor. This resistor is there to limit the current through the sinner. Even though it said that MOSFETs draw no current, this is purely out of precaution. I also added this other resistor to protect the MOSFETs gate. More on this in the documentation. If you have already worked with MOSFETs, you might already know this. If you touch the gate of a MOSFET, it might sometimes switch on whatever load is driving, and it won't turn off unless, for a Pichano MOSFET, as we already know, the voltage applied on the gate is lower than the source. This is because MOSFETs exhibit capacitive properties, and if we ignore this issue, we can end up with an unstable system, and that's a real problem. That's why we need to add a pull-up resistor on the gate, and the other lead will be connected to the positive supply rail. This will ensure the MOSFET is solved by draining its parasitic capacitance, therefore keeping it in a non state. In fact, in the very first version of this port, I totally forgot to add this resistor, and the circuit wasn't even turning it off when it should. That was a huge fail. It was driving me crazy, but the board is now fixed and works as expected. Next, this is where the interesting thing happens. We need another MOSFET, but now of the N channel type to keep the other MOSFETs gate connected to ground, so that when the NCU takes over, the system is kept on once we depress the brake pedal. For this, I'm using the common 2N7000, and again, we have another resistor on the gate, which is then controlled by one of the pins of the microcontroller to switch the system on or off when scanning an NFC tag. We need to add another resistor, but this time uses a pull down for the N-channel MOSFET, again, to keep it off and not floating. We will see more of these resistors using the same manner throughout the circuit as we go. After that, we have the circuit for the 5V switching voltage regulator. This is what everything in the system is drawn off of, except for the relay, which works at 12V, or whatever the battery or alternator voltage output is for that matter. According to its datasheet, the maximum voltage the LM2574 can regulate is 45 volts. It will never reach those limits because we already have the TVS diode to protect it, so we are safe. You might be wondering, why not use a simple linear voltage regulator instead? Well, I did consider that option, however, during the prototyping part, they turned out to be quite inefficient and were getting hot even at low currents. That's why I'm going with the switching regulator after experiencing this issue. Their biggest advantage is that they are very efficient, which means that we don't have to worry about heat anymore. Switching regulators are really on another level. They work quite well. No wonder why they are so popular and widely used nowadays. Now, I am not even going to try to explain how switching regulators work, as there is plenty of information available about them out there, and the datasheet does an excellent job at helping us sound to select the appropriate components. But, there is one thing I want to emphasize before continuing. Even though switching regulators are remarkably efficient, one of their biggest drawbacks is the fact that they are very noisy. If we look at the output voltage, we'll see that it's not a smooth signal at all. This is an output repo. As a result, we need to use an inductor and capacitor in this configuration of the output, also known as LC filter, which will reduce the noise to substantially lower levels. Good. As I already mentioned, we're going to use the 80 mega 320A. They are really easy to use with the Arduino IDE. The true version of this microcontroller has 14 IO pins in total which is more than enough for our project. Pins 7, 20, and 21 are connected to a decoupling capacitor for stability. Then we have a resistor going over to the reset pin, as well as a capacitor that goes down to ground, again, to provide stability against noise. And in pins 9 and 10, we have the crystal circuit to provide a clock signal. As for the other pins, they are connected to other accessories and components. For example, pin 18 controls the MOSFET that acts as the master switch and turns the whole system on and off. Pin 27 and 28 create the I2C line that tags to the NFC reader module, which leaves the board through this header. This is what it looks like in real life. One last important thing to mention here 
is the RX and TX lines. They allow us not only to program the NCU, but also to be able to use it with the serial monitor that comes with the Arduino IDE. We do this through this pin header, in which we'll plug a programmer, so that uploading the code can be an easy process. It's a feature that is extremely handy. You'll realize this very soon. Here we have another MOSFET that is in charge of controlling the relay, connecting to the ignition switch. We already covered what these two resistors do, so now let's focus on these two components. The diode used this way is known as a flyback diode. Relays have coils, therefore, as we already discussed, they are a source of transients, and when we turn them off, current keeps flowing, and we get voltage spikes on the MOSFET strain. That's why we need this diode, in order to divert the inductive spike away from the circuit until it dissipates. The right thing to do is to keep the diode as close to the relay as possible. Hence, I bought these relays that already come with built-in flatback diodes for redundancy purposes. I highly recommend that you get one of these as well. The capacitor also, to put it in simple words, helps to reduce noise by absorbing them. We use a couple of these in the circuit, most of them physically close to the connections leaving the board. Anyway, let's now check this simple circuit. We have another MOSFET which is driving a buzzer connected to this current limiting resistor. The truth is that the buzzer I selected for this project is not as loud as I wish it was, and used like the scanner light, it alerts us of what the system is doing by, of course, playing different sounds. Next, let's go down here. The simple circuit is hooked up to the read switch mounted on the kickstand. This line is connected to one of the pins of the NCU, so that it can read the state of the switch. This resistor up up here pulls the line to 5 volts, keeping it in a non state and not floating. In this case, it is pulled high. We don't want the microcontroller to be getting random readings. This other resistor and this capacitor help stabilize the input and get rid of the noise that could be picked up by the wires. The NC reader and ice scanner are controlled by this MOSFET so that before the system goes to sleep, the MOSFET's gate is pulled low which causes the NSC reader module and the scanner light to be switched off and then switched back on again when waking up. The clock line here generates the appropriate signal for the light scanner to work. We'll talk about this in a bit. This resistor and this capacitor have the same purpose as the ones in the kickstand circuit in that they help suppress noise. Lastly, we have these symbols that represent through-hole pads where we're going to solder the wires that lift the board. From these pads is where we're going to get power directly from the battery, and this other group of connections supplies power to our accessories leaving the enclosure. The only pin headers are these two. This one here is a MOLEX connector, the KK254. With it, we can plug and unplug the reader very easily. The other pin header, as I said before, is where we are going to plug the programmer to adopt the code. It's so easy to use, almost like you would normally do it on an Arduino board. These two connectors have the standard 2.54mm pitch. Alright, that's all there is to this part. Now let's move on to the light scanner circuit. To the left again, we have the connectors. One is for the power rail and clock line, where the NCU signal is coming from, and the other one is for the LED bar. Let's go through what's in here to the right. We are using the CD4017. This IC is a decade counter, meaning that it has 10 outputs. To show how it works, let's hook up this LED in the clock line to visualize it better. In order for the IC to work, we need to feed a clock signal into pin 14. The signal is just the microcontroller switching the pin on and off, generating this square wave, hence the name, clock line. As I said, we're getting this signal from the pin 6 of the MCU. You clearly can see its effect on the red LED turning on and off continuously, and this signal is what causes the IC to toggle its 10 outputs generating this nice effect on the blue LEDs. Now, you have to know that the animation that you see here is the actual effort operation of the IC. It creates this linear effect where the LEDs are one by one turned on and then turned off. However, if we change the configuration by attaching these diodes on the output in this manner, we now get this back and forth scanner effect. But the downside is that, now instead of having 10 LEDs, we can now only use 6 LEDs, but still, this looks good in real life. I know the most advanced users will say, why not use another microcontroller or a shift register instead? Well, you're completely right, 
they will do the job as well. But I just wanted to use hardware instead of software for this part of the project and really explore a different way of achieving things. Alright, we're done for this section. So now let's move on to the software side of things and talk about the code. Before we start looking at the code, there is one thing we need to go through first. The majority of the code was based on a flowchart, which really helped break down complexity. This flowchart is almost like a blueprint. It's critical that you comprehend it. Most of it is written in plain English, so it's quite easy to read. Take a look at the flowchart symbol names if you're not too familiar with them. So let's review the flowchart to understand the working principles of the system. To keep things short, the most important thing you have to keep in mind is the fact that it's all divided into what we're going to call modes. These modes are what are going to allow us to interact with the system and have access to certain functions. The first mode we have access to is the disarm mode. This is the state that the system goes through first and it happens when the motorcycle is completely off and we turn on the system momentarily in order to scan tags by pressing down on the brake pedal. And if a valid tag is not scanned, the system will turn off. However, if we do scan a valid tag, this will turn on the motorcycle and now the system will be in the R mode. Here, we are able to turn off both the system and the motorcycle by, again, scanning that same tag or any other valid tag. But there is more to the story. In this mode, we will have access to other two modes. We first have the say the leak tag mode, and second, the sleep mode. The names are self-explanatory. The system enters into sleep mode once the kickstand comes up, triggering the read switch as we saw previously. On the other hand, to enter in exit out of the say the leak tag mode, we need to use another NC tag, which we're going to call the master tag. In reality, it can be any valid tag, but we're just assigning it to just one tag so that we specifically have access to this mode. This tag is very important, and you must keep it in a secure place. The interesting part is that, besides doing what the name literally says, in the save the tag mode, we will have access to another mode called the erase memory mode, which will basically allow us to erase all tags saving memory. There might be cases where you might want to do this. Maybe when someone steals your tag, and you don't want them to use your bike without permission, so it's really a feature that comes in handy. To enter into this mode, we need to trigger the read switch mounted on the kickstand. As you can see, we are just reusing and taking advantage of the already installed switch to interact with the system. It's not only meant to enter into sleep mode. To erase all tags, we just need to rescan the master tag, and this will automatically take the system out of this mode back into save the leak tag mode. Now, let's go back to the disarm mode. This might sound confusing. But in that mode, we can also have access to the save the tag mode. The reason behind this is that, imagine if we lose all our tags or rings for whatever reason, then this will mean that we won't be able to turn the motorcycle on. And because of that, I designed the system in such a way that we're able to use the master tag as a regular key. However, the side effect is that, besides turning the system on, it will automatically enter into save the tag mode but we can easily modify this behavior in the code if we wish. I just decided to keep it like this. In the code, all these modes are nothing more than plain infinite loops, and all of them have conditional statements to decide whether or not we take the system into another mode or out of the current mode we are in. Alright, to better understand the code, I got the whole system set up on my desk. This is what I got installed on my motorcycle. We have the main board with the NSC reader inside, then the light scanner, and the root switches. This one will simulate the brake pedal, and the one right here will simulate the kickstand root switch. Here we have a relay, and finally, I am powering the board from a 12 volt power adapter. With this setup, you'll see and hear the system in action as we review the code. I'm going to connect the programmer to the board, so we are able to use the Arduino serial monitor. I am not going to dive deep into the code, because explaining every little detail will take me hours, so we're only going to explore the important concepts. On the screen, right next to the Arduino IDE, I'll put a flowchart and see how it's interpreted in the code as we go along. You'll see how everything makes sense. First, we have this macro, which will allow us to use the serial monitor functions. This is only for debugging and explanation purposes for the video. Besides that, 
Sure, the code will see other functions just to print information, but we are not going to cover them as they have no impact on how the system works. We can disable all those functions for explaining certain information by just commenting out this line. That way, we can save some memory and speed up program execution. Down here we have several variables, but let's just focus on these three. This is an array that will hold the master tag UID number, and you can get a number very easily by using the serial monitor and enabling the macro I just talked about. For the next two variables, we first need to learn a couple of things. The 80 mega 320A has a special memory called EEPROM. This is a type of non-volatile memory, which basically means that we can save information to it and it will retain that data even if we remove power from the chip. For this particular microcontroller, the EEPROM has 1024 bytes available for us to use. Now, let's imagine that the EEPROM looks like a long sequence of cells, where each cell represents a byte in which we can store data. So if our NC tag has a 7 byte UID number, then we can save each single byte on each cell just like this. Then, this means that we are able to store 146 different tags in memory, leaving us with 2 bytes free. However, the reality is that we can only save 128 different tags, and here is why. For every tag we save, we are going to assign it an extra byte, which we are going to call tag exist flag. This is actually a variable that is pretty much related to this other variable with a similar name in the program. So for every tag we want to save, instead of reserving 7 bytes for it, now we need 8 bytes. This extra byte is very important, and it's at the very beginning of each tag UID number. Its purpose is to tell whether or not a tag is saved in memory. So instead of scanning every individual byte in the imprompt to find a tag, thanks to this new approach we just talked about, we can now make our lives easier by just looking for this specific byte at the beginning of each tag address. Then, if a 1 is written to it, this means that we have a tag UID number. If we go and read the next flag and find that a 0 is written to it, which is interpreted as false in the program, this tells us that there is no tag saved in the next 7 bytes of memory. The program then continues on to read the next tag exists flag, and so on and so forth. Esto es sin ninguna duda mucho mejor. As you can see, this is faster than scanning each individual byte address. Just imagine doing this a thousand and twenty-four times. In the code, this variable is used for a couple of functions, so if you see it, you know what it does. Good. Let's go to the loop function. The first function to call is, of course, the disarm mode. As you can see in the flowchart, what we do first is to make sure the reader is connected, and if it isn't, then we're going to play a sound and turn the system off. Let's test this. I'm going to open the serial monitor. Now, I'm going to disconnect the reader and then turn the system on by passing the magnet by the read switch. There you go, it works. With the play sound function, as the name implies, we are able to generate the sounds for the buzzer. All the sounds names are defined in this enumeration. As you can see by looking at their names, they are the arguments that we're going to send to the playson function. The function contains several switch case statements, most of which in turn call other functions that are going to play the specific sound we need. They are all defined in this header file, which we already included at the beginning of the code. Now, as to how we go about generating the sounds, this is explained in the documentation. This while statement is an infinite loop, and we're going to keep looping through the functions below. As you can see in the flowchart, what we do first is start a countdown timer and constantly check if it's time to turn the system off. This function takes care of that. It is our turn off countdown timer, and the limit time is defined by this variable. I set it to 10 seconds. Then, this function will actually generate the square weights for the scanner light, and it will take as an argument a number that will change the switching speed of the square waves. This will obviously result in the change of the light scanning speed. If you notice in the flowchart, it says play background sound. The reason why is because the system will play a single tone continuously in the different modes. Each one of them is slightly different from the others as a way to tell us which mode we're in. For example, let's compare the sound between the SAR mode and say the leak tag mode. Okay. 
What we do next is to scan for attack, and if we don't detect one, the loop will continue running. Otherwise, if we detect attack, again, we play a sound. This is where we go back to the part we discussed earlier about security. We are only interested in tags that have a 7 byte UID number. And since the reader can also read 4 byte UID tags like this one I have here, we need to ignore them because they are not secure. And this is exactly what this line does. If we do a scan a 4 byte UID tag, the system will reject it and play a sound. Again, I'm going to turn on the system and scan the 4 byte UID tag. And as you can see in the serial monitor, it gets rejected. If the scan tag has a 7 byte UID number, we need to verify that it's either the master tag or a regular tag. Once we check this, we immediately turn on the motorcycle, and after that, we play a sound to confirm this. This is the part I talked about earlier. We need to know which kind of tag we scan. If it is the master tag, we set a flag, which we are going to need later. This is very important. And then, we enter into save the lead tag mode. But, if the tag is just a regular key tag, then the system enters into the R mode. Let's test this. We'll scan the ring. And there you go. It takes us to the R mode. I'm going to scan it again to turn off the system. I'll turn it on again. But now check what happens when we scan the master tag. We are now in the save the lead tag mode. One thing I added in the R mode is the option to control how long the background sound can play. For example, if you choose to run your motorcycle and you sleep there without riding it, maybe you're busy doing something else, it can be annoying listening to the buzzer the whole time. That's why, as you can see in the flowchart, we can control the playing time by using a countdown timer. In the code, we can change this value thanks to this variable here at the top of the code, and the function will take care of the rest. And again, we change the light scanner speed. In my case, I went with a lower speed for the R mode, but it's really up to you. The difference here is that now that the motorcycle system is switched on, we need to check whether or not the motorcycle is moving by reading the state of the kickstand read switch. This function is in charge of that. If the kickstand stays down, we keep looping just like in the disarm mode, looking for attack. But if we raise the kickstand to go for a ride, then we are going to enter into sleep mode. But first in this function, we need to recheck that indeed the kickstand switch was triggered to avoid false readings. After verifying that, now we can call this function. And this is where the interesting thing happens. Before going to sleep, we play a sound again, and then we need to recheck that the kickstand is still up. This is for redundancy purposes, and soon after, we start turning off the lights and the reader, and now, the whole system goes to sleep. We have already attached an interrupt to the pin connected to the read switch, so that we are able to wake up the system when we fall down the kickstand again. So I'm going to pull the magnet close to the read switch and see what it does. As you can see, it turns off the accessories, and once I remove it, everything goes back to normal and we are again in the R mode. From this part on, when it comes to scanning attack, it is almost the same as in the disarm mode, however, now if we scan a regular key tag, we will turn off the motorcycle. This is really what we normally do, a scan once to turn it on, a scan again to turn it off, whereas if we want to save or delete attack in the EEPROM, then we just need to scan the master tag. This is the part where we need to use the flag we said at the beginning, but this is only if we use the master tag to arm the motorcycle. If we did, then after scanning it, we will turn off the system, otherwise we will enter save the lead tag mode. Here again in this mode, we play a sound and set a new speed for the scanner light. As I said, here we are able to enter in the last mode, which is erase memory mode, but we'll talk about this in a bit. When a scanning attack, we first need to know if it's the master tag or a new 7 byte UID tag. If we scan the master tag, then what we will do is exit this mode and go back to the R mode. However, if we want to save a new tag, first we need to make sure that the memory isn't full. If there is a space to save a tag, we then proceed to save the tag in the EEPROM by using pretty much the same mechanics we discussed earlier. We look for an available spot by reading the tag exist flag before saving it, or if you want to delete the tag, again, 
We look for this flag and then compare the tag UID number to the tag store in memory that we want to delete. Simple as that. Let's see this in real life. This is a ring with a new tag, so I'm going to save it in memory. I'll scan the master tag. Then I'm going to scan the new ring. As you can see, it's now saved in memory. If I want to delete it, I'll scan again and it will be deleted. Alright, now to enter into the erase memory mode, we first need to fold up the kickstand as if we are ready to go for a ride and then fold it back down. The reason why is that once we enter into erase memory mode, there will be another countdown timer. I set mine to 20 seconds by changing this constant at the top of the program and when the countdown goes off, we will exit this mode and if the kickstand is still up, we will keep entering into this mode and that's really a nuisance. Anyway, to raise our tags every memory, we just simply need to scan the master tag. After erasing them, the system will exit this mode. Otherwise, if we scan any other NFC tag, be that a regular or even an invalid tag, this will take the system out of this mode while we erasing any tags. Of course, we play a sound as a warning for exiting. Let's see this in action. I'm going to raise our tag semi memory. In the R mode, I'll scan the master tag. I'll pass the magnet by the kickstand red switch. Now that we are in erase memory mode, I'll scan the master tag again. As you can see, we erase all tags and the system automatically access this mode. Alright, hopefully it all makes more sense. There are several things I didn't explain. Well, to time constraint issues, I can only cover so much, so let's move on to the next section. Let's talk about hardware. The entire schematic was designed on Evo. All the files, again, are in the link in the description. And as for the PCB, I made sure the board was easy to assemble by selecting only true home mount components, except for this SMD inductor for the switching regulator. Once you order your boards and get them made, the next step is to solder the components onto the board, as well as the connectors. The only component that we're not going to solder onto the board for now is the microcontroller. This is because if you have a blank chip, we first need to burn the bootloader on it. The bootloader will allow us to upload the code into the chip from the Arduino IDE, as well as being able to use the serial monitor. The details on this process are explained in the documentation. Anyway, once you do that, now you can solder it onto the board. After that, we are now able to modify or upload new code using the programmer. One important thing you need to know is that most of the electronic components on this board are AEC qualified, meaning that they are tested and approved to work under automotive conditions. The main takeaway here is that they are able to withstand more extreme temperatures than many of the electronics that you probably have at home. This is of great concern for our project. We can agree that motorcycles are almost naked machines. You are literally riding on top of an engine, and the fact that the weather can be a predictable out there, there is a need to make our electronics more rugged, so keep this in mind. On the other hand, the enclosures were designed on Fusion 360. The leads lock into their positions thanks to these protrusions around the inner edges of the base case. It's a snap fit mechanism. They're very secure and work quite well. After sending them off for manufacturing and receiving them, we carefully place the ports inside and then apply a little bit of the silicon sealant around the edges of the boards, so that they don't come loose. Even though the boards sit very tight inside the enclosures, we need to be cautious. Also, don't forget to secure the reader to the cover. Next, we need to decide how much wire we're gonna need. This really all depends on where you decide to install the accessories and, of course, your motorcycle dimensions. But in my case, the main board is inside the right setup bag. This is where I'm gonna go and run my wires from. A pair of wires go to the fuse and battery. Then, I also have the wires for the red switches running under and to the sides of the bike, both for the brake pedal and on the left side the switch for the kickstand. And last, the set of wires for the light scanner board and the relay run all the way from the main board under the gas tank and then to the speedometer. Once you decide how much wire you're gonna need and cut it at the appropriate lengths, it's time to crimp them so that we can insert them into the connectors. As you recall, 
I choose to use Mons connectors mainly because of the locking mechanism and the fact that there is no need to be worried about connecting them the wrong way. Anyway, after you crimp the wires using their appropriate terminals, now you have to slide them into their connectors. For this part, I recommend you to draw a simple diagram so you know what each pin of the connectors does and you don't end up mixing up the wires in case you decide to change the connections later on. The next step is to solder some wires to the root switches. I use heat shrink to protect the bare terminals. As you can see, I added connectors on the end of the two pair of wires for easy installation. I then crimped the wires for the fuse holder and pushed on the fuse right after that. The holder apparently is waterproof, so that's a plus. Here you can see the final result of the set of wires for the main power connector that is going to the battery as well as the other accessories. Be consistent when choosing the wireless colors to help you tell them apart. One thing I like doing here is to twist all the wires like this. You will find that it will be easier to work with later. And to keep them from unraveling, I carefully hit it with a butane torch, so that the wire's insulation builds up a new memory to pull it away. Just don't overdo it. Next, I bought these wire zips to protect the wiring assembly. Their official name is Split Braided Tubing. They are so easy to use as they are very forgiving if you cut them to the wrong length. You can easily take them off. Of course, you can try and use electrical tape just like the crappy jobs I done before, but believe me, they will not only look very unprofessional, but also they won't really hold up that well in the long run, so use wire zips if you can. As I mentioned earlier, I mounted the main board inside my motorcycle's right saddle bag. My initial plan was to place it in the speedometer unit. Despite the fact that there is very little room inside, the cover is made of some kind of metal, and this effectively blocks the reader from the scanning tags. If you have a spork spike, you might find it easier. I also consider making an enclosure and mounting it in the center of the handlebars, but I didn't want to take apart the panel switch that controls my other accessories, so inside the setup bag it has to go. Anyway, with this in mind, I bought some wire and set off to make this somewhat rusted holder that tries to mimic the shape of the enclosure so I could mount it securely inside the setup bag, which of course I took apart beforehand to make the necessary adjustments and drill the holes for the holder. After that, I'm going to use this tool called a hand riveter so I can, as the name implies, use some rivets to secure the wire holder in place. I consider different options to achieve this, but I settled on buying these nylon rivets because they provide a rather cleaner look than other solutions. Granted, the final result is not perfect, but it matches the saddlebag look, keeping a low profile. And as you can see, they will keep the enclosure secure in its place. Alright, the next thing we're going to do is use the last one, entirely depends on your motorcycle. We need to install the light scanner. We, of course, need to remove the speedometer unit from the motorcycle. I then proceed to make the pylon holes for the 3mm LEDs by using a center punch. Shortly after that, with the drill ready, I started drilling out the 7 holes. In my case, the spacing between each hole is 1.5cm. Once we're finished, we place them into the respective spots and solder their leads. Again, we apply sealant to protect the exposed connections, and to finish things up, we crimp the wires to later add the connector and cut a piece of split brain tubing to protect them from chafing. Nice. Now that we have everything ready, it's time to do the final installation on the motorcycle. But before that, we first need to know how we're going to bypass the ignition switch. I have a Yamaha B Star 650, so the process depends on your particular motorcycle. The best thing you can do is to look for the wiring diagram. This is extremely important, so please, Look around on the web or ask your motorcycle manufacturer, otherwise you might end up chasing your own tail if you decide to figure out the wiring on your own without any previous knowledge. I done it before, it's not fun. Anyway, this is the wiring diagram from a motorcycle. Thanks to it, I know that to bypass the ignition circuit, I have to use two relays to stimulate the switch that will connect these wires together. By splicing into these wires, I can still use my regular key to turn my motorcycle on or off. In case something goes wrong with the Kiris ignition system, pay attention to what color the wires are, so you can identify them in real life. Okay, now let's go outside and get to work. First thing first, after removing the battery cover, we need to disconnect the negative cable terminal from the battery, 
to prevent anything from shorting out. In my case, to have access to the ignition circuitry, I first need to remove the gas tank. For this part, we need to shut off the gas bed cock. Then, since I already removed the speedometer, the next step is to disconnect the breather hose of the gas tank. In this situation, what I recommend you to do is to grab a piece of plastic and wrap it around the hose, and then secure it with a strand of wire or anything that will prevent them from coming off. Do the same thing for the other breather line where it was connected to. We do this in order to prevent debris from contaminating the fuel system. Next, before disconnecting the fuel hose from the pet cock, I made a container by cutting the bottom part of a plastic bottle. We're going to use it to collect the fuel that will come out, then carefully take the hose out and let the fuel drip into the container. And again, we grab a piece of plastic to protect the fuel tube by wrapping it around it. Once you're done with that, then we need to take out the bolts that hold the gas tank to the chassis. Depending on your motorcycle configuration, you might need to take the rider or seat off after. Alright, that being done, to take the gas tank off, we pull it back just a little and then carefully lift it up and leave it in a safe place. Finally, we remove the bolts that hold the ignition switch side covers. Here is one tip that will save you a lot of trouble. When removing bolts, screws, or any similar small parts, keep them in ziplock packs or any container, then label them with a sharpie so you can easily find them later on. The goal is to keep them organized and save time when putting everything back together at the end. Now that we have access to the ignition wiring, looking from the left side, you can see these three connectors with four color wires that match exactly that of the wiring diagram. As you can tell, it's very easy to identify which wires are going to be switched on and off by the relay. The wiring diagram makes this process very simple. Knowing this, we need to cut one of the connector's wires. I accidentally cut the wires from both connectors when I only should have cut one. Don't make that mistake, we only need to cut one side. To make the splices for the ignition wires so I can connect them to the relay, I am going to use these pack connectors and I am also going to put these female crimpon spade terminals on the end of every wire which are going to be plugged into the relays. They are colored because they accept a certain wire gauge. I really like them for these applications because there is no need for soldering. We just need to crimp them and this alone forms a very strong connection. And the best part is that they are waterproof. For that, again, I just use a butane torch to heat it, which makes the outer insulation shrink, releasing in the inside a sort of a gel that will seal the connection. We then don't need to add heat shrink tubing. This is what I ended up with after splicing into the wires from the ignition connector. Please ignore the other splices from the other connector. As I said, I cut and cleaned both connectors, but I only needed one. We are stuck here because now we need to install the wire hardness to our motorcycle so we can connect the relays to the main board and the other accessories as well. You previously saw how I decided to go about routing the wires, but here is a quick roundup. I started from the setup pack. This is the main connector. And then inside the battery cover is where I distribute power to the other accessories. Here I have the fuse connected to the battery. From this cable that goes down is where we get the signals from the two root switches for the kickstand and brake pedal. They each have their own connector as well. We'll install the root switches later. This cable distributes power to both the light scanner and the relays. To hide it, it runs under the gas tank. You can see it here, but I already ran the wires for the two relays right in that spot. I secure all the wire loops to the frame using zip ties. I use plenty of them to hold them in place. I think you would agree that the wire zips really blend in here. They look like they originally came from the factory. Anyway, take your time to work on this part and don't forget to avoid running them over hot and moving parts. Ok, back to where we left off. Now you can slide the spec connectors into the relays terminals. Double check your work. Remember that these relays come with building diodes. After that, I grab a zip tie to secure them to the frame, and then I took them in, right in that spot near the ignition connector. The last part is to install the red switches. For the brake pedal, I mounted one switch on the frame under the bike so that it can be triggered via this rod with a magnet that later will be attached to it. The rod moves back and forth when we press the brake pedal down. I just use a little bit of epoxy to glue the root switches to the frame. Since I am using neodymium magnets, they can trigger the root switches very easily. As you can see, the way I did it here, the magnet doesn't even need to directly face the root switch to trigger it. Play around with them until you find that a sweet spot. 
Finally, we do the same thing with the root switch for the kickstand on the left side of the motorcycle. I installed it close to where the kickstand pivot is located, and on this road, I mounted the magnet, making sure that it doesn't get in the way of other moving parts. Therefore, when I pull the kickstand up, it directly faces the root switch. And with that, we conclude the final installation. All you have to do up to this point is to put everything back together after you have done the appropriate adjustments and tested how the system works, and we're finished. We have arrived to the end of this project. Congratulations! Now you don't have to fumble through your keys anymore. Just use your ring and enjoy the ride. To wrap up this video, once more, I just want to remind you of the documentation. I will update it based on your ideas or suggestions. Also, don't forget to watch the video about how you can make the rings. Other than that, that's it for today. My name is Christian, and I'll see you in the next one.